So we've established a few things through the past few weeks. Uh, relatively, relatively simple things if you've been around a while, but not if you haven't. And so we've worked to show that uh, Yeshua, most certainly, Jesus, Yeshua, as his mother would have called him, did not turn Judaism upside down. He did not reject Judaism. He did not reject the Torah. He did not even reject the oral instruction of the sages of Israel. But he did do some things that at first glance do not really seem to fit into a traditional understanding of Judaism. In other words, when you read through the New Testament, there are some sort of confusing things for the first bit of what I just said based on what we actually see or perceive Yeshua to be doing. And some of his Jewish contemporaries seemed to be really mad about some of the things that he was doing. And he seemed to be at times really mad at them about some of the things that they were doing. So what do we do with this? There are many, many examples that could be raised. But today, and, and I'm, I'm simplifying this so very much because there are so many things. And I actually cut out about... 50% of what I was going to talk about, because as I was thinking it through and working it out and, and sort of practicing my thoughts, we would have been here till three o'clock in the afternoon if we tried to talk about all of these things. So we have to whittle down. And there are two really, really, really easy things to talk about when it comes to some of the examples that the Christian faith uh, or non-Jewish believers in, in Yeshua could suggest as some of these issues. But I want to focus on the things that really, really rile people up. Because I'm good at that. Just ask my parents. Food and the Sabbath. Food and the Sabbath. Okay, everybody loves food. We discussed Matthew 5 last week. We used it as an example. I did not come to abolish the Torah. No, not to abolish, but to fulfill. Right? And yet, there is a perception. And you can, I just would ask you to raise your hand if you have ever been told or heard that Jesus declared all foods clean. That Jesus removed any type of restriction on what we eat. In other words, that Jesus overturned the Torah when it comes to biblical eating. Why? Because that is the Old Testament. That is the law, and we are no longer under the law. Anyone ever heard anything like that? Okay, good. Well, we have something to talk about then. It wouldn't be fun. Right? Or how about, how about this day? The Sabbath, Shabbat. Anyone ever heard or been told that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday after Jesus resurrected from the grave? Anyone ever heard that? Okay, good. We have more to talk about. But these are, the, these are really easy. And so... To be honest with you, I'm taking the easy road because there's just so, so much to talk about here that makes the point for the bigger, broader reading of the New Testament or the apostolic scriptures or the gospels in context. Because as we have been told and as we have now affirmed within the room, we have been taught that Jesus brought a new message, radically different message, which turned everything upside down and made the world, let's be honest, a much better place. Pepperoni pizza makes the world better. <laughs> I've had it. It really does. And that he brought, really, and this will be our conclusion, because I've decided I could not, as I said, fit all this in. So I'm going to add one more message week to this. It makes five. Why would I make five series, five messages in here? If the Torah gets five books, Yeshua gets five messages. That's the way I reconcile this. 
But, but in the end of it, and where we want to end up with this, is that not only did he overturn, abrogate, throw out all those things, he brought a completely and radically new message. Believe in me and go to heaven, which is, by all accounts, the gospel message. So you put that one in a back file for now because that's where we're going to sort of end up next week. But it is important at this point to, to step back and remember the what it was supposed to look like message that we had, which was from the book of Acts, Acts 15. You remember this, the Jerusalem Council. This is where Paul and James and all of the heavy hitters were getting together. And they said, Jews will continue to observe the Torah. Gentiles would maintain certain levels and, and the rest they would learn as they grew in understanding. But in other words, bottom line, the Torah wasn't going anywhere. And it was our job as Jewish believers in Yeshua to educate those who had come out of the temple of Aphrodite and Artemis and Mars and all those things. So we were all going to get together right in here on Shabbat at the synagogue, learning Torah and learning to follow Yeshua. Did that happen? No. We spent the first week talking about why and how that didn't happen. But... That already poses some pretty big problems for many, many, let's call it the Andy Stanley theology. Okay? I'm, and I don't even mean that critically. It just so clearly represents something. It represents that the Old Testament, including the Big Ten, as Pastor Stanley has said, is irrelevant. It's been removed. So this Acts 15 story, compared with that idea, we are at a major, major Headbutt, because they cannot align. And the number one issue that I have experienced, and I'm, I'm promising you this, over the course of my, my not Jewish life, not my pre-Yeshua life, everybody understood why I ate like I did pre-Yeshua, because I was a Jew under the law. But my post-Yeshua Jewish life, when I go and sit down with someone and, and there, or have conversations about this, and, and it's like, why do you do that? You don't have to eat like that. Jesus set you free from that. You don't need to do that. Or when you do that, do you think that you are more holy than other people? Because you know what you do doesn't make you holy, right? I've been on the receiving end of a number of these conversations. And so this, as I, I wasn't joking, talking about the food that people eat really, really, really makes for some hot conversation. So we're going to start with this idea of what is called kashrut, kosher, Leviticus 11. This text in Leviticus 11 says this. Well, maybe it does. The text in Leviticus 11 says, The Lord spoke again to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the sons of Israel. These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever has a divided hoof, showing split hooves, choose the cud among animals that you may eat. And then he goes on to add some things that we can eat. Those you, these you may also eat of whatever is in the water. Everything that has fins and scales in the water and the seas and the rivers you may eat. But whatever is in the seas and in the rivers that does not have fins and scales among all the teeming life of the water and among all the living creatures that are in the water, they are what? Say it out loud detestable things to you. And he goes on at the end of the kosher laws to say, do these things because I do them. In essence, we know God doesn't eat, but he says, be holy for I am holy. Okay? Now, that's kashrut. Now, Judaism has expanded kosher laws into worlds, volumes upon volumes of how you eat kosher. But that is the biblical basis of a couple others that are out there. Now, that takes us nicely into looking at what Jesus thought about the Torah's kosher laws and what the first pope thought about the kosher laws. Peter, of course, the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And the first that was sarcasm. And Christian, the first Christian 
Paul of Tarsus, who was, when he was Jewish, a Saul, but now he's Paul and he's a Christian. And let's talk about what he thinks about eating ham. Now listen, actually, I should have said this at the beginning. Nothing I'm saying is intended to be judgmental. And I make jokes because I'm comfortable in here saying those things. I am not criticizing someone for the way that they eat. What we're actually talking about here is not your diet, but what Yeshua said about the Torah and the biblical food laws create a great example. So I should have said that at the outset. Don't feel judged. Don't feel like I'm looking at you when I'm talking. People always say that like I, he was looking at me. I bet he was. I bet he was talking about me. I'm looking at everybody. And so, <laughs> but here's where, we, here's where we go. We go to Mark 7. We can look in Matthew 15 too because we get a great, great thing. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered to him, Yeshua, after they came from Jerusalem and saw that some of his disciples were eating their bread. I want you to read this with me. Eating their bread. Okay. Great. What, what, and, and then he, they go on to ask Yeshua a question. What was that question? It's in the next slide, actually. Some of the Pharisees, they came, uh, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, why do you yourselves also break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So pause right here for one second before we go any further. What's the question? Why don't they wash their hands before they eat according to the tradition of the elders, which would be the, the Pharisaic law, the extra biblical law, the law of how we prepare ourselves to eat a meal? Why don't your disciples do that? They don't ask him why he doesn't, and they don't even ask him why all of his disciples don't. They say, why don't some of yours? We've noticed that. So mark that with a big, big red line. What is the question? Why don't they eat with their hands washed? Okay, we together on this? Good. What was the answer? The answer is in the next slide. It's actually in Mark 7. <clears throat> it's the answer is shalom making. Come here and learn. I'm going to tell you what the answer is, because I will find it right here while Blake works on that. We're doing a full revamp of all kinds of things in the computer system and the live stream, so everyone give Blake a hand. <clears throat> Here's the answer. Again, he called the people to him. because Well, actually, pause. Hang on. The disciples were a little confused. The disciples were a little confused because they said to him, you understand that what you said really rattled them. That, explain it to us. What, what did you actually mean when you said these words? <clears throat> Listen to me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that goes into a man from the outside can make him foul, but the things that come from the inside of the man are the things that make him foul. Now, when the crowd left and had gone home, his disciples were asking him the meaning of this story. And he answered them, are you too without understanding yet? Do you not know that nothing from the outside that goes into a man can make him foul because it does not reach his heart, but only his stomach, and then passes off into the waste? This translation, which is called the Williams New Testament, then goes on to say, in thus speaking, he made all foods clean. There is the foundation of the theology. Thus, he declared all foods clean. How ignorant does one have to be to not read that and think that means all foods are clean and now I can eat whatever I want. That is very clear, right? Thank you, Roger. You would think, but there's a challenge. 
a fairly big challenge. And it's interesting to note, let's look at some other, let's look at the, a number of translations here. Because what we have is several, do we have PowerPoints or no? Okay, next. <clears throat> next. Oh, these are, I get it, I get it, I get it. I was looking for different slides. Go back, I'm sorry. I know this is, this is the most horrible way to deliver a sermon you could ever imagine. You're like, my God. Goodness. NIV, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Another translation, the New Living Translation, food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Do you remember Leviticus 11 that we just read prior to this? The New American Standard, the NASB, thereby he declared all foods clean. We have one more. God's word, by saying this, Jesus declared all foods acceptable. It's pretty obvious from that. For once, not for once, that's haughty. The King James actually translates this properly. The King James translates this properly. Because of it, and I have to get my, because it thou entereth into thouest. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draft, purging all meats. The Young's literal translation says this. Because it doth not enter into his heart, but into the belly, and into the drain, it doth go out, purifying all the meats. That's kind of gross, but do you know what it's really saying? What goes in, goes out. <laughs> Into the sewer. And purifies your system, like is removing waste from your system. And I, we don't have to talk about that in great detail. <laughs> God gave us a gift when he gave us a digestive system. But man, and, and, and we could get into like a lot of grammatical stuff and we could get into textual arguments about some of the early manuscripts of the book of Mark don't even have that part in it about declaring things clean or purging. But in general, a lot of the manuscripts do have it. What don't they have? Thus he said, or thereby declaring, that's an addition to the text. And what does that addition do? It completely separates Yeshua from the Torah and from the Jewish biblical dietary food laws. Because what is he saying? That is not true anymore. Whatever you put into your body is totally fine with God. That's not what it says. And when you theologically bias it that way, you create a grave amount of confusion because what person has the time in real life to sit down and read that and not think, it's, that's it. I'm not going to go back and if I work 60 hours a week and have a family and all these other kinds of things, you think I'm going to sit and study 50 different versions of purging all meats? It, it says it. It's good enough. Jesus declared all foods clean, but he didn't. He did not. And that's tricky. I get it. I get that. But here's what I told you in the beginning. And actually, listen to Matthew 15. Listen to Matthew, which is the same story. This is the words of our master Messiah, Yeshua. These are the things that defile the person. And that's like envy and hatred and slander and all that stuff. You know, I can, I can tell you what those things are, but... Um, uh, evil, sexual immorality, stealing, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, abusiveness, haughtiness, thoughtlessness. Let me tell you something. Those things, if they're in you and they come out, they make you real unclean. 
But Matthew 15, 20, he says this. These are the things that defile a person. That list I just gave you. But to eat with unwashed hands, that does not defile the person. There's no mention in Matthew about purging meats or declaring foods clean. Yeshua's conclusion is, you know the question they're asking you about eating with unwashed hands? That's not going to make you. That's, that's not real. Living a godly life and having a pure heart that loves others, that's real and that matters and that will defile you if you don't. You with me on this? Makes sense? Good. Let's go to a even better example. And we may actually only be able to talk about kashrut today, but let's see. Let's see what God says. Peter wasn't the first pope of the church, by the way, but he does give us an incredibly good, good foundation for talking about the dietary laws in the Torah and in the first century. Acts 10, you can turn there if you want, but I have some slides. <clears throat> and this text from Acts is even more widely used to say that everything that was is no longer because Jesus changed it. We just talked about how Jesus didn't change it. Okay, But let's look at Peter and Acts 10. Um, on the next day, as they were on their way up, this is on his way to see Cornelius, the God-fearer. They were on their way up, approaching the city. Peter went up on a housetop about the sixth hour to pray, but he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And on it were all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the sky. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. Pay attention to what just happened right there. By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Okay, we'll pause it right there. To talk about what just happened. And I know this is review for some people, but it's review for you, and it's good. This is the rock. This is Kepha, the rock upon whom Yeshua said, I will build my community, right? This is Jesus' right-hand man. Here's the question. This is Acts. Jesus has died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Why? Is Peter still observing the dietary laws? We just read in Mark 7 that Jesus did away with those, and Peter was there to hear the lesson, I assure you. Was Peter now a rebellious Jew against Jesus' new words? An even better, stronger question is, Dr. Ralph, if you're treating a patient and God tells you in an audible voice to do something, do you think you would say, no way, God, I'm not doing it? Would anyone in the room, if they heard God speak in an audible voice, say, no way, I can't do it? What, what uh, uh, chutzpah? There are a lot of words we could use, but what chutzpah, Peter? I mean, to say no to God? Which is exactly what he did. He said, I can't do that, God. That's a violation of Torah. I have never done that. I've never eaten anything unclean. And yet, it's very important to notice something about that sheet. That sheet contained all kinds of animals, which means that it could have had cows and goats and chickens and all kinds of things that you could eat, trout, 
salmon, all kinds of good fish, but also could have been in there alligators and chameleons and you know, if it was a big sheet, elephants, I don't know. It was, a, it was a sheet filled with mixed animals. And God says to him, Peter, kill and eat. Why didn't he just say, okay, God, I'll kill the cow and eat it because it's kosher. Or, okay, I'll have some chicken wings if it makes you happy, God, come on. Because they were all mixed together. And the interaction of these kosher animals, these pure animals with these unkosher animals, that's not kosher. That's not cool. I mean, we have this, this mixed thing going on here. And so remember a big topic of conversation that was going on in Jerusalem about the Gentiles. Do you remember what it was? We don't eat together. We don't hang out together. You Gentiles are unclean. You're dirty. You're idol worshipers. We don't do that. We don't interact. And don't take this the wrong way, but we, we don't get in the sheets together. And that's what I'm, I don't mean that the way it sounds. I'm saying we don't do this thing where we're mixed together. Right? That wouldn't be kosher. And somehow or another, Peter remained perplexed by what he saw here. He was confused by why God would ask him to do this thing. It actually says it. He says Peter was perplexed in the next slide. Uh, Peter was greatly perplexed in mind as to what the vision he had seen might mean. But all of a sudden now, not long after that, Christianity totally figured out what that means. The one who received the vision, the one who was with Yeshua, upon whom the community of disciples was going to be built, was perplexed, but yet the church, no slamming intended, knows what it means. It means what? That we can eat anything we want. Because God told Peter in this mixed multitude of clean and unclean that he should go and eat it. So there it is. If, if Jesus' words aren't enough for you, then maybe Peter's should be. What's the huge problem that we run into here? Peter is no longer perplexed when he gives us the interpretation of the vision. You ready for the interpretation? It's, it's pretty clear because Cornelius is now asking directions to Simon's house. Uh, I mean, he had been sent by Cornelius. He's doing all this. They appeared at the gate calling out, where's Simon, who was also called Peter? And he said to them, here is the very, very important interpretation. The Gentiles came looking for Peter. He had had this vision. He's on the roof. They find him. And Peter says these words. You yourselves know it is forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. And yet, God has shown me that I am not to call any person, 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 people, human beings, Gentiles. Gentiles. I have now received the revelation from God that he is truly doing a miraculous thing in Jerusalem. Jews and Gentiles, one in Messiah. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you put in your mouth. It has to do with God building the foundation, the ecclesia, the body of Messiah, that Peter and Paul and all of these guys were going to interact with Gentiles. And what were they going to do? They were going to bring them into the Acts 15 rules. Synagogue fellowship. It didn't have anything to do with what they ate. Does that make sense? 
It's irrefutable, honestly. Why? Because I said it? No, because Peter said it. Peter, the rock, understands what God was saying to him. Shouldn't we? He told us. And then I am going to end with this because there's no possible way we'll get to the rest of it. So we just, now you got Torah plus one coming at you, I guess. Um, the book of Joshua. Perfect. Joshua, that means Yeshua. So we have five. <laughs> because I have to end with Paul. And Paul has a number of great texts. Romans, 1 Corinthians. So let me, can I just read you a little bit of 1 Corinthians? I'm going to save Blake the trouble of trying to manage this. And let me just read you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> There's a chapter in 1 Corinthians 10, which is all about idolatry. It's about idols. Why would Paul be talking to the Corinthians about idols? Any ideas? Because they were idolatrous pagans prior to understanding who Yeshua was and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he has some information for them about idols that they need to understand. One of those things is about food that is sacrificed to an idol and whether or not you can eat that. Because in Judaism, you cannot eat food sacrificed to an idol. And so he says some things like this. So then, my dearly beloved, keep on running from idolatry. I'm speaking to sensible men. Decide for yourselves about what I say. And then he goes on to talk about how you can't, you can't love God and love pagans. You can't love idolatry and love the God of Israel. You can't be a disciple of Mars and a disciple of Yeshua. They don't interact. And so therefore, we need to be aware of some things, he says. You cannot eat at the table of the Lord and at the table of demons, or are we trying to incite the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? Don't tempt God ever. That's a hidden lesson from Paul there. Everything is permissible for people. Listen to me. We're in verse, I can't even see it. We're in verse 25, maybe? 23, thank you, Dana. Everything is permissible for people. But not everything is good for them. Everything is permissible for people, but not everything builds up their personality. Now listen to me. That also seems about as clear as Jesus declared all foods clean, right? I mean, everything is permissible to everybody? Surely Paul's telling me that means I can eat whatever I want. Well, I'm not going to throw you a curveball and say the translation's off or that they added things to it. That's exactly what he says. And then he goes on to talk about why, how we handle eating in a pagan's house or eating meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. No one should always be looking after his, uh, his own welfare, but also that of his neighbor. As a rule, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without raising any question about it for conscience sake, for the earth and everything that it contains belongs to the Lord. Did you hear what I just said? Paul said it. Eat everything sold in the meat market and don't worry about it. I wouldn't make a very good lawyer if that was going to be my closing point, would I? <laughs> I'll remind you. I'll ask you. Who is Paul talking to? Gentiles. And do you know that as a Gentile, you still can choose to eat ham sandwiches and pepperoni pizzas and shrimp, and every other thing. You can choose to do that without fear of condemnation or burning hellfire. Jews cannot. Jesus never changed that for Jews because the Torah still applies. 
Peter never changed that. If he did, he really messed it up because he didn't get the message and he interpreted the thing totally wrong. But Paul is saying to the Corinthians what Acts 15 said to the Gentiles. These four things I need you to do. And eating kosher like a Jew, although several of the four things have to do with what you eat. Idolatry, strangled things, that's, that's, that's not good. But he's saying to the Gentiles, listen to me, you can do it. Everything is permissible, but not beneficial. Now, why would he add the second part to that? Well, why did he say the first part? Why did he say you can eat what's sold in the meat market? Because that's what they had been doing, and that's what they were used to. And it had been obviously declared by the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 that that was not the most important thing that they needed to be focused on. They were going to come into the synagogue, and they were going to learn maybe the benefits of, of Torah, which they had no connection or concept to. Biblical living, which they had no concept or uh, attachment to. But for now, listen, just don't do these things, okay? So go ahead and eat that. It's fine. It's permissible. But it has not been official. Do you understand the difference? Why would it not be beneficial for Gentiles to eat pork and shellfish, as an example? It's not a trick question. I'm going to see if anyone answers it. Why wouldn't it be beneficial for them to do that? Yeah, according to this particular text, that's true. That's good. I'm thinking much more dumbed down than that. You ready? Because the Torah says you shouldn't do it. Because God gives instruction to the Jewish people, which says... Don't eat these things. And now, according to Ephesians 2, I'm sorry, Blake. According to Ephesians 2, the Gentiles have been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, partakers in the promises. Does that mean, you know, you just, that's like the adopted son who comes in and has absolutely, the big brother's got all the rules. The younger brother has absolutely no rules and does whatever he wants because he's adopted. So who cares? <laughs> that's not how that works. But the adopted brother is given some time to understand how this house functions. And how these are mom and dad. This is dad's rule about this. And so it's permissible, but it's not beneficial. And ultimately, Paul would suggest you're going to learn that as we hang out together and become one family. You're going to learn that in the synagogue. But no one's going to judge you. Now, please. It, it, there's a thing where it says, Paul goes on to say, so I do whatever I want to do based on who I'm around. Do you, do you really think that means that Paul ate the Hawaiian pizza with the ham and the pepperoni? It did not mean that. Because in Acts 21, he says, I've never done anything against the Torah or against even the traditions of the elders. So, it's really, really important to take two points away from this. One, well, one, it's not judgmental toward you. Even what I just said, you could, you could take it that way, but let me, let, me, let me buff that out and polish that up a little bit for you. Jesus never ate a pepperoni pizza because if he did, he's not your Messiah and we are sunk. We have no hope. Why would that be? Because he's a Torah violator in that case. He has broken the laws of Leviticus 11. Right, David? Peter did not change anything. Paul did not change anything when it comes to the Torah and its application in our lives. 
What they did do, Peter, Paul, Mary, hmm. Peter and Paul, they spoke to Gentiles about how to be the younger brother. Let me be your big brother. Let me show you some things. Yeah, I get it. It's okay. You're eating the, the pig head. Fine. Maybe one day when we get together at the synagogue, you'll see we don't do that. And maybe we'll have a conversation about why we don't do that and why you might receive a rich blessing from God by choosing to live and eat according to his instruction. But they were gentle about it. And unfortunately today in Messianic Judaism and Hebrew roots circles, a lot of people are not gentle about it. And they will criticize somebody for what they eat and how they don't do this or don't do that. That's not the point. The point is this, and it's been the point sort of from the beginning of this message, and this is the conclusion. W-W-J-D. Someone says, I can eat whatever I want because Jesus said I could. No, he didn't. But yes, he did. Well, no, he didn't. We're not doing that. You technically can eat what you want as a Gentile. But is it beneficial? That's the question you get to answer. But if we're serious with each other about what would Jesus do, and we model our lives after our rabbi, which is what disciples do after their rabbi, that's why I don't have any disciples, <laughs> then our lives would look like his life and Peter's life, and Paul's life. Not as Orthodox Jews. I'm talking about simple things, like the decisions we make about what we put in our mouth, understanding that that is not the thing that defiles us. It's the hatred, the animosity, the licentiousness, the adultery, all those things. God forbid. But, but God says in the Torah, he tells his people Israel, and thereby his Broader Israel, Jews and Gentiles, one and Messiah. Choose life. Choose life. Choose blessing, not curse. The cursing happened to Israel when they chose to disregard the Torah. The blessing came when they chose to elevate the Torah and to live by it. So as I've said from the beginning, the Torah is not for you a prison cell. It's not intended to make your life miserable. It's intended to be a source of blessing, which God has given to you to know and understand. And I do understand. I've told this story many, many times. But when I got to Louisiana as a backslidden Jew and found like alligator burgers and crawfish heads and everything, at first I was like perplexed like Peter. But the next thing I know, I had no God in my life really at that point. And I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And I did. And I liked it all. Everything I could eat, pretty much, I liked. From rattlesnake to, to bratwurst to... I never ate pig's feet. That was, just, that was just illogical to me. I mean, they eat their own fecal matter and they lay in it. You're going to eat their feet? Come on, man. I mean... But I understood now when I came back under the fold because my doggone dad reminded me that I'm Jewish and have certain things that I should be doing as a Jew. When my dad put me under the law, I remember how difficult it was to change those habits that had become part of my life. And amazingly, they still are. When I see a crawfish boil advertisement or, you know, somebody I remember killed a wild hog and buried, put, dug a hole in the ground and roasted it over leaves. And it was the best, most amazing thing I'd ever eaten in my life. And it's what I've told you before. If you never tasted sin, you wouldn't lust for it. <laughs> but once you taste it, buddy, 
It's hard. So I get why everyone wants to say Jesus declared all foods clean. And the blanket with all the animals, that was my permission to have the meat lovers. (laughs) And now we've talked about Paul's words. And I'll leave it up to you. I can't let you walk out of here believing that Jesus changed it. But how that applies to you, this is your decision to make. And so my job as a rabbi is to teach. And God willing, that's what has happened in this room today with an understanding of how Jesus did not undo the Torah. We'll talk about another one next week. How's that? Shabbat Shalom.